It's an old physics quip that Richard Feynman's approach to solving problems was a three-step procedure. Number one, write down the problem. Number two, think very hard. And number three, write down the answer. That strategy is all well and good if you're Richard Feynman. But what about for the rest of us? Well, I can't give you a single trick that'll let you write down the solution to any physics problem in the world without any work. But as a matter of fact, there is a strategy that can get you most of the way to the answer for many kinds of problems. Dimensional analysis. It's one of the most essential tools in every physicist's problem-solving toolkit. In this video, I'm going to show you how to apply it to three very different problems. Finding the oscillation period of a simple pendulum, the binding energy of a hydrogen atom, and the event horizon radius of a black hole. If you're a beginning physics student, you might already be familiar with a solution of the pendulum problem, but I'm certainly not going to assume that you have experience with the quantum mechanics of the hydrogen atom or the black hole spacetimes of general relativity. And that's the beauty and power of this technique. Dimensional analysis is universal, and it's usually step zero in trying to solve any physics problem. The numbers that we measure in science typically have dimensions. For example, time, length, mass, charge, and so on. And we set up systems of units in order to establish standards for how to compare them. Seconds for time, meters for length, kilograms for mass, and coulombs for charge. These are the standard SI units that we use to measure these quantities. In a given physics problem, we have some list of parameters at our disposal. Masses, lengths, charges, as well as fundamental constants like the gravity constant big G, the speed of light little c, and Planck's constant h bar for quantum mechanics. And we're looking for an answer with some particular dimensions, like time or energy or whatever. The idea of dimensional analysis is just to figure out how we can combine the given input parameters in order to get the correct units of the desired output. Just thinking about how we can assemble the parameters of a problem to get the units right often gets us 90% of the way to the answer to our question with next to no effort. Let's start off with a simple pendulum example. It's a particle of mass m attached to a lightweight rod of length l, which is pivoted at its other end. If we pull the pendulum up to some initial angle theta zero and then let it go, it'll oscillate back and forth. The question is, how long does it take to complete a full oscillation? This quantity is called the period t of the pendulum. If you've learned some mechanics, you might have solved this problem before using f equals ma. But say you didn't know anything about Newton's laws or differential equations or anything like that, and you only knew about Galileo's experimental observation that falling bodies near the surface of the Earth all experience the same constant downward acceleration of little g, which is about 10 meters per second squared. What could you say then about the period of the pendulum? Well, the period has units of seconds, and the parameters we have at our disposal are the mass m in kilograms, the length l in meters, the initial angle theta zero, which is unitless, and little g in meters per second squared. We want to figure out how we can combine these quantities to get something with units of seconds. The only place that seconds show up here are in the units of little g. If we flip it over and take the square root, in order to put the seconds on top, we'll get seconds per square root meter. Now we need to get rid of that factor of square root meter in the denominator, so we should multiply this by the square root of l. That gets us seconds. And so the period of the pendulum must be proportional to the square root of L over G. With next to no work, dimensional analysis has gotten us the most important part of the answer. In your intro mechanics class, you might have computed that the period is more precisely given by 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Dimensional analysis can't tell us anything about that factor though. 2 pi is just a pure number without any units. Thinking about the dimensions alone, tells us that the answer has to be proportional to the square root of L over G, but it doesn't say anything about whether there's a two or a pi or the square root of 17 that multiplies it. Still, the units tell us a lot with minimal effort, like the fact that the oscillations of the pendulum get slower and slower the longer you make the rod, and moreover, that the period cannot depend on the mass of the particle. M can't appear in this formula because we don't have another parameter handy with which to cancel out those units of kilograms. Two pendulums of the same length, one with mass 1 kilogram and the other with mass 2 kilograms, will oscillate at the same rate. Finally, what happened to the parameter corresponding to the initial angle, theta 0? That parameter is unitless, so just like the factors of 2 and pi, the dimensions alone don't tell us how the period will depend on the initial angle. We could in fact insert any function, f of theta 0, in the answer and still get the correct units. 
As it happens, f is about equal to 1 for small initial angles. But at larger angles, the period does depend on theta 0, like I told you about in an earlier video that I'll link up in the corner. But okay, maybe you thought that example was a little too easy. Let's look at another, the binding energy of a hydrogen atom. This is the amount of energy you would need to kick the electron out of its orbit around the proton and send it flying away. This is a cartoon. The electron is not actually orbiting the proton in the sense that a planet orbits a star. To understand the details here, we need quantum mechanics. But even without knowing much of any quantum mechanics, we can still get most of the answer just by thinking about the units. So what parameters do we have to play with this time? Classically, the electron experiences a Coulomb force due to the electric field of the proton. F equals K times E squared over R squared, where K is Coulomb's constant and E is the elementary charge. That's measured in Coulomb C, so K had better have units of newtons times meters squared per Coulomb squared. That way we get newtons on both sides of the force equation. So we have K and E to work with, as well as the masses of the electron and proton. But the proton is so much heavier than the electron, by a factor of about 2,000, that we'll treat the proton as if it's infinitely massive and fixed in place. Then we add the mass m of the electron to our list in kilograms. We're also assuming that nothing is moving close to the speed of light here, so that we don't have to worry about relativistic corrections that depend on little c. Finally, since this is a quantum mechanics problem, we also have Planck's constant h-bar, which sets the scale of quantum effects. That has units of energy times time, or equivalently, kilograms times meter squared per second. Again, the question was to figure out the binding energy of the atom. So we want to combine these quantities to get units of kilograms meters squared per second squared. The first thing to notice is that we need to cancel out the units of coulombs, which means that k and e have to enter in the combination ke squared, raised to some power, call it a. Then we can add on m to the b and h bar to the c. Now it's just a little exercise to figure out what a, b, and c have to be in order to get units of energy out of this expression. I'll leave that for you to do for practice. I also show you how to work it out in the notes for this video, which you can get at the link in the description. I'll show you there that we have to set a equals 2, b equals 1, and c equals minus 2. Therefore, dimensional analysis tells us that the binding energy of the hydrogen atom must be proportional to m times ke squared quantity squared divided by h bar squared. Plugging in the numbers, this gives about 4.36 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. The experimental value is meanwhile about 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. So it seems our formula should come with a factor of half. As always, dimensional analysis can't tell us about unitless factors like this too, but it again got us almost all the way to the answer while needing to note next to nothing about quantum mechanics. Now go look up the solution of the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom in a quantum mechanics textbook for the exact derivation, and you'll appreciate just how efficient dimensional analysis is. Let's quickly look at one more example, this time from Einstein's theory of gravity. If a massive object like a dying star is compacted into a dense enough ball, it can form a black hole, an object so dense that not even a ray of light can escape its gravitational pull if it gets too close. How dense would the star have to be? The parameters we have handy are the mass m of the star in kilograms, the gravitational constant big G, which you can show has units of meters cubed per kilogram per second squared and the speed of light c in meters per second. We want to find the radius that we would need to squeeze the mass into to form a black hole. So we're looking for a quantity with units of meters. First, we need to multiply m and g together to cancel out those factors of kilograms. That gets us meters cubed per second squared. And so if we further divide by c squared, the second squareds will cancel out and we'll be left with meters. Again, there's an additional factor of two in the actual answer that we can't get from dimensional analysis isn't there always. And this is the event horizon radius of a Schwarzschild black hole. If a mass m is compacted into a ball smaller than this radius, it'll form a black hole. Then if a deep space explorer, or a passing ray of light, is unfortunate enough to approach the black hole, once they cross the horizon radius, they can never escape back out. It's the point of no return, from whose born no traveler returns. I haven't proven that to you, of course only shown that if such a critical radius were to exist, it would have to take this form based on dimensional analysis. Whenever you come up against a physics problem in the future, remember to pause before you start diving into complicated equations, and just ask yourself how you can combine the quantities in front of you to get something with the correct units that you're looking for. And when you do solve all your equations, remember to check that your answer does indeed have the correct units, 
If it doesn't, then you know you made a mistake somewhere along the line in your derivation, and you need to go back and check your work. I explained more about that in a video from a few weeks ago that I'll also put a link to in the description. Again, you can get the notes for this video down below. Please hit the like button, leave a comment, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.